Okay, so now I'm going to let everyone in. Sorry. Hi everyone, welcome. As you're coming in, we're just letting people in. Thanks for your patience. If you have your video cameras on, if you wouldn't mind just turning them off and just keeping your microphones off and your cameras off, just so we can stay focused on our panelists this evening, that would be great. Thank you so much. Just waiting for a few more people. Great, well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this, this evening. Um, happy Father's Day to everyone who it applies to. My name is Sari, I'm the Public Programs Manager at MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink. Thank you so much for joining us, it's great to have you all. And as you're entering, we're just asking everyone to make sure their cameras are off, make sure that your microphones stay off for the program. Thank you, we'll get started in just a minute. Perfect. Um, also, there's two different options. <laughs> My career. There's two different options for looking at your Zoom screen. There's a speaker view and a gallery view. So I definitely recommend switching your screen to a uh, speaker view if you don't have it that way, because that way your screen will really stay focused on the presenters this evening. Um, so just a couple housekeeping things before we get started. Like I said, my name's Sari. I'm the Public Programs Manager at MOFAD. We are the Museum of Food and Drink. Um, right now, we are an online museum, just like you know everywhere else. We don't have a physical space that we're interacting with, so we've moved all of our programs to the internet. Um, so you know, it's it's a difficult time, but we are so happy. There's still ways to connect, even virtually. Um, so this is really fantastic. Normally we're in New York, but you know, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of you are coming watching this from other places outside of New York. And this is a really wonderful opportunity to connect with a larger community. Um, so if you have your cameras on, if you wouldn't mind just shutting that off for, for the evening. So we're just focused on the panelists and just keeping your microphones off so we don't have any, distra any distractions from the speakers, that would be great. Thank you, perfect. Um, so the other things I wanted to let you know is that we're recording this talk. Um, that's another reason why we ask that you keep your cameras off. We're not using it for anything specifically, just for archival purposes. We are going to have a Q&A at the end of the conversation. For right now, your chat boxes are disabled. You have a little chat box function at the bottom of your screen. But when it's time for Q&A, which will be the last 15 minutes of the hour, we'll open that up so you can chat your questions for Chef Huni and for Kathy right in there. Um, so as opposed to asking questions with your microphone on, you'll just be able to chat your questions in that box. So that'll be later. If you have questions that come up, just jot them down, just make a note and we'll get to them later. Um, I'm gonna quickly pass it over to my colleague, Lisa from Gastro Obscura. And she's gonna tell you a little bit about Gastro Obscura before I get started. Um, but just wanna encourage you, if you haven't yet signed up for the MOFAD newsletter and the Gastro Obscura newsletter, to please do so. So you know, you know when our programs are, that's the best way to keep in touch. That's the best way to find out when our virtual programs are, they're happening every week. Um, so please you know, take the time. I'll make sure to email everyone tomorrow and send you those links. So Lisa. Hi everyone, my name is Lisa Gross and I'm the Director of Strategy and Partnerships for Gastro Obscura. So Gastro Obscura's mission is to inspire wonder and curiosity about the world through food and drink. Gastro Obscura's articles, videos, and guides explore what food and drink reveal about the places where they're made and the people who make them. And in partnership with chefs, historians, and other experts, Gastro Obscura helps travelers and curious people experience culinary wonders firsthand. And Gastro Obscura is part of the website Atlas Obscura. So thanks so much, Sari. Thank you, Lisa. All right, so I want to introduce you to our panelists this evening. Of course, you're all here for Chef Huni Kim, and I'm so glad that Kathy has the book uh, that she's holding right there. Perfect, beautiful. And if you haven't ordered it yet, absolutely encourage you. It's such a beautiful book. So Chef Huni Kim was born in Seoul, Korea, but has resided in New York City for over 30 years. He is the chef of Danji and Hanjan, both in New York City. 
In 2012, Donji received a Michelin star, which is the first ever for a Korean restaurant. He divides his time between New York City and Korea, where he is the founder of Yori Chunza, a nonprofit that trains orphans to become cooks. His long awaited debut cookbook, My Korea, Traditional Flavors, Modern Recipes, was published by W.W. W. Norton in April of this year, 2020. And then we have our good friend, Kathy Irway. She is a James Beard award-winning food writer and the author of The Food of Taiwan, Recipes from the Beautiful Island, and the memoir, The Art of Eating In, How I Learned to Stop Spending and Love the Stove. Very good for pandemic times. She hosts the podcast, Self Evident, exploring Asian American stories and Heritage Radio Network's Eat Your Words. So I will pass it over to both of you. Take us away, Kathy. Thank you so much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sari. And thank you, Chef Huni Kim, for joining us tonight. And happy Father's Day to you. Thank um, you. I'm the father amongst us. And uh, <laughs> hope you hope you get to chow down right after this. Or, <laughs> and now you got some, some goodies awaiting. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, but first off, I just really want to congratulate you during this incredibly challenging time as a restaurateur and as a chef and as a book author now for mm -hmm. the incredibly hard earned and inspiring pivots that you have made with your restaurants right now in light of COVID-19. I mean, you have done what I think a lot of people would have thought was just impossible, which was more or less kind of stay afloat. But even in, in addition to that, you have really created something really wonderful and unique with your heat and serve meal kits. Um, and it just seems so, so fresh and it just seems to speak of your very innovative and enterprising spirit. So tell us a little bit about what your, how that's going right now and yeah, um, still going door to door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically, you know, I've been open, well, one restaurant, Donji has been open 10 years. Hanja's been open eight years. So um, about two, three weeks before the city closed us down, we saw the numbers where there, you know, there was something wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and having been open for so long, we knew something was really wrong because um, the numbers kept going down and down and down and down every day for basically almost two weeks straight. So um, before we closed down, we just decided, you know, if they weren't coming to us, we need to be going to them. Uh, we reached out to our regular customers um, and they said the same thing. We would love to eat your food, but we just don't feel safe going out. Um, so yeah, before we, we were closed down, we started this delivery uh, uh, service. Um, a lot of my customers who weren't coming tended to be parents with children. Um, mm. School was still, uh, they were still attending school at that time because school closed down in New York City a couple of weeks later. Yeah. Um, but they were staying home um, instead of going to work the parents uh, and they didn't want to cook. So they asked for help. Okay. We started with just, I think 12 orders initially. Yeah. Just regulars that we have. I and see. then the first week word got out uh, we sold 80 the first week. Um, the next week, 120. By the third week, we were at 160. By the fourth week, we had 50 people on the wait list. And 160 was all we could do because I was the only person who could deliver uh, in my wow. car. Wow. Uh, one of my other staff members actually had cards uh, in New York City. That's pretty common. Um, so we, we, we did that for a while, um, or we're still doing it. But then I think beginning of May is when all the parents with their children took off. Uh, <laughs> they left the city. Uh, a lot of them left the city. Yeah. Um, and we had to adapt and adjust because the food that we were cooking uh, was very child friendly, you know, nothing spicy, um, sort of easy to eat. And now we spice things up because a lot of the people uh, or, that are ordering are couples um, mm -hmm. and not, you know, parents with children. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, nothing was really planned. We just did it because that's what the customers wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, it's what I would have wanted. 
if I didn't enjoy or enjoy cooking or wanted to cook. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's swallowing your pride, um, not considering yourself an artist or, or somebody who uh, does something so well, people, get, people are going to come to you. And that's what, you know, most chef owners have been, you know, we uh, do what we do very well. So people come to us. Um, but now it's the other way around where it's not about us anymore. It's not about, about our talents. It's not about Hanjan or Danji. It's what our customers need. And they just need good nutritious food uh, without having to travel. And that's the service that we're providing. It sounds like you have a deep, you know, deep reserves of culinary uh, resources, really, within um, both your personal take uh, of, you know, food presentation and, you know, just you have a ton of experience in cooking from, you know, you worked at Danielle and Masa and all these places, but um, also within Korean cuisine, it sounds like it affords you the opportunity to do something very kid friendly, not spicy, which is not something a lot of people think of when it comes to Korean food. Um, definitely very healthy, um, vegetable forward, as well as, you know, I don't know what else, very uh, <laughs> comforting and sort of soothing. Um, I know a lot of people have a different idea of what Korean food is and we can get into that. But tell me a little bit about how you've uh, worked within the cuisine or within the bounds of uh, your idea of what the cuisine is. Um, so when I first opened Danji, um, I just thought that a restaurant, my restaurant or any restaurant, its job was to cook delicious food. And that was going to make people come to your restaurant and result in a successful restaurant. It was all about flavor. And because the flavor is important, you, you try to uh, get the best ingredients possible because you know the better ingredients have better flavor. Um, but th th that's also because I learned how to cook French food. I learned how to cook Japanese food uh, at restaurants. Um, yeah. When I started learning about Korean food, and, and I opened my restaurant without actually having an education or experience working at another Korean restaurant because there weren't any real Korean chefs in New York City at that time cooking Korean food. 2011, um, right? Yeah. 2010 we opened. 2010, yeah. Yeah, and, and David Chang was around, but he wasn't really cooking Korean food. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the 32nd Street Koreatown restaurants, there weren't real any chefs. Mm -hmm. to learn from. Mm -hmm. So um, I went in just blind, cooking delicious food with, with, with delicious ingredients. Because of uh, Danji's success, I was able to go to Korea very often uh, and get in contact with people who wanted to really show me um, or, or expand my horizon in, in Korean food and Korean, the culture of Korean food. And what I learned was um, Korean food isn't what it is now or didn't become what it is now because of restaurants. Korea doesn't have a history of restaurants. Um, it's been in many, many wars. Um, the Korean economy was, was not something uh, to be proud of until the 70s and the 80s. Uh, people didn't eat out at restaurants. Um, so the whole restaurant culture compared to France, Japan, very young. Um, and, you know, we don't have a history of famous Korean chefs uh, writing very extensive books and recipes. Right. We don't have that. Uh, what I was taught was it's the Korean mothers cooking in the kitchens that uh, really passed on the, the recipes and the traditions and the techniques from generation to, to generation for hundreds of years. And that has never really been written down, but it's the mothers who cook for their children and family that is the real sort of uh, foundation of Korean food. And because of that, flavor is important. But what's ultimately the most important is nutrition. Korea mm -hmm. not being a very wealthy country, it was about trying to feed your family so your family can be healthy, fight off disease, and grow. Um, so the number one step when you're cooking Korean food, everybody told me, is healthy ingredients. Um, and 
then the next step is the mother has to make this healthy ingredient delicious because that way, you know, your family eats more of it. Right. Um, and when you think of it that way, when you think of a cuisine that way, it, it's very, it's the antithesis of what we learn, you know, in, in the restaurant. Because it's, you know, for a restaurant, we cook with a lot of fat. We cook a, with a lot of salt. Um, Say f fats? Fats, with a lot of fats, right? I yeah. thought I heard sass for a second. Oh. <laughs> like, that's, that's true, too. <laughs> but um, yes, sass, yeah. And, and another thing that I learned um, in Korean cuisine was because of fermentation, um, the negative aspects of salt uh, mm -hmm. and, and sugar when it's fermented is, it's not as unhealthy after it's fermented. And that's what Koreans believe. Um, so, you know, during when we ferment, we use the best salts possible because uh, when you use salt that's not natural, uh, the fermentation doesn't work very well. And that's why I talk extensively about what salt you should be using when you're cooking, not just every day, but also spe specifically with fermentation. Uh, wow. Because when you're making a kimchi with kosher salt, it starts, the texture of the cabbage after about six months starts getting soft. Now, in fermentation, when the texture of the vegetable that you're fermenting starts getting mushy, that's when the fermentation has stopped. That's when the good, by, uh, the good bacteria has stopped growing and the bad bacteria is actually taken over. It's all about the texture that tells you if it's healthy, has a lot of probacteria, um, or, or it doesn't. And I've had in Korea kimchi that was eight years old, that was so crunchy that it felt like it was kimchi made yesterday. Um, and, and that's because of, of the ingredients that is just all natural uh, with no chemicals, which is very tough to do in this country and in Korea all over the world right now. And that's one thing I think um, I, I tried to stress more. It was muted a little bit <laughs> because I was a little too gung-ho about it. But yeah, I hope, you know, this book is a little bit more about cooking Korean food because you can apply at least the, the, the philosophy that I, that I learned in Korea, cooking with natural ingredients, staying away from the chemicals uh, as much as possible. I love it. I love that um, it sounds like you've gone full circle then in a funny way because you are now feeding families what they need right now, you know, nutrition, healthiness, everyday food. Um, and, and, and how you explain that, it, it makes all the sense in the world. It's actually, um, it's a very generous um, um, thing to share. And I, I love that you didn't, you know, a lot of cookbooks feel like, oh, you can take the shortcut. You know, I really love learning from the real chefs and the real practitioners of a cuisine, what, it, why? And like, not just how to really make that kimchi, but why? So I, I love that throughout this book, you are really doing that. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the cover, if everyone uh. can see. Now, a lot of people, when they think of Korean food, they think of punchy, spicy, red flavors of, mm chilies basically. <laughs> so why did you decide to go with this cover? Um, that That's cover nice. with a salted cabbage mm -hmm. is, is the first step when you're making a kimchi. Um, and it's, it's this, this technique of not salting it in between the leaves, um, but salting where it's the most dense, uh -huh. which is closer to the, the, the bottom part. You, yeah, you, you, you're salting more there and less towards the, the green parts. Okay. And, and that's a technique that I just learned two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, for hundreds of years, Koreans didn't make kimchi that way. Mm. But through, um, I wouldn't say modernization, but some really smart people trying to advance uh, this, this technique of making kimchi to make a better kimchi. Um, they started doing that. And I just learned it two years ago. And, and I think that is what I've been trying to do with my restaurants the whole time. Um, I do have a background in classic French cuisine as well as Japanese. Right. And I have the utmost respect for 
Korean cuisine and, and especially the technique. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I don't know if you've ever picked up a Korean cookbook, a Korean Korean cookbook, but they're not about numbers and, and, and specific times or, mm -hmm. or, or measurements, just a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, and for a mother who, who's been cooking for a long time, especially Korean food, it's very easy to follow because you taste as you go along and you know how things are supposed to taste. Um, but for Americans, we don't know. Uh, and for most of the people who are buying my cookbook, um, a lot of the, the dishes will be, and a lot of the techniques will be new. So I wanted to be a lot more specific. Um, and I wanted to make with what I know better, the, 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 te the, the ultimate result. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought this picture of this hundreds of years old tradition of kimchi that has been modernized by this simple technique of, of salting at different places, I just thought it was a very good example of what or who I am or who I want to be. Mm. Okay. And just to get a little bit technical, why is it that you call for the medium coarse salt, preferably from the Andes or the Himalayas? Instead of kosher um, salt or so far. Yeah, you no, know, Koreans love sea salt. Uh, okay. Sea salt for hundreds of years has been the best kind of salt. Okay. Uh, because our oceans were clean. Um, that's changed in the past 20 years. Uh, our, our oceans, our seas are not clean anymore. And if you're um, getting your salt from the sea where uh, there's a lot of carcinogens, your salt is not going to be uh, all natural because it will be uh, contaminated with all the wastes in our salt. Um, right now, the highest elevated uh, lakes that we can get mountain salt from, lakes, uh, lake from lakes in the mountains, are the Himalayans and the Andes. Got it. And so it is the most non-contaminated salt that you can find. Wow. Wow. It makes a difference. You know, you're not going to notice the difference when you're seasoning in, in sort of like French cuisine or, or if you're seasoning a la minute. But mm -hmm. when you're seasoning to, to ferment something for years, it makes a huge difference. It makes, um, you know, it's the difference of your kimchi fermenting uh, for eight years versus six months. And mm -hmm. that, I think, is worth it. Wow. Mm. Tell me a little bit about um, the island that your father is from in Korea. So you, so you describe this as um, a place that is like, it seems like time has stopped. It's called Soando. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you, you say that it's, uh, the, the people on it descended from five original families of settlers. And um, they, they, they raise their own livestock and they grow vegetables. They dry their own chilies and they ferment their own jungs, the, mm -hmm. the sauces. Um, but you went there as a child um, several times. Was every this farming year. every summer? Every, every summer. Every summer. Until my grandmother passed away. Mm. And um, was this cool to you back then, <laughs> this pastoral ideal? No, it's still, you know, my, my father's buried there. My grandmother's buried there. Uh, my grandfather's buried there. It's still um, the furthest place on earth, in my opinion. Um, when I was young, for me to go there from New York, I would have to, uh, you know, take a cab to the airport. The airplane would, on its way to Korea, stop at Anchorage uh, because it was too far to go direct because in the older times, we couldn't fly over the Soviet Union. So we had to fly over, uh, we had to go around. So it wasn't a 14 hour trip. It was more like a 17 and a half hour trip. Mm -hmm. And back then uh, there wasn't a plane that could go direct. So we had to stop at Anchorage for a couple hours to refuel. Uh, we would land in Seoul. Uh, from Seoul, I would take another plane to Gwangju, which was just an hour long trip. Uh, but from there, I would have to take a bus uh, to uh, Wando. And from there, I would take a ferry uh, about two and a half hours in, but the ferry was too big to dock at Swando. 
So a little uh, little motorboat would come out to pick us up in the middle of the ocean. So we would have to transfer from a ferry to a little boat in the middle of the sea, and I couldn't swim. That was oh. it was scary. And I think because of that, I still can't swim. And from there, you know, it would be a thirty-minute, you know, uh, boat ride and onto the island, and then a twenty-five-minute walk to my grandmother's house. It would take three days. Wow. Uh, it still takes, you know, uh, a whole day mm -hmm. uh, to get there from even Seoul. Uh, but yeah, I hated it. Um, <laughs> you know, that, the whole island electricity shut off at 9 p.m. The whole island had one telephone at the one market they had. And it was that it was a telephone that didn't have numbers that you could dial or press. You pick it up and it wow. went to the operator uh, inland. And then you have to verbally tell them what number you wanted to call. Uh, and they would connect you to the rest of the world. Um, yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it was definitely another world. Um, my clothes were weird. Everybody <laughs> complained that my jeans were too tight. Um, That's and nobody I'm... called me by my name. Nobody knew me as my name. They always called, they only knew me by my father's, you know, my, as my father's son. So they would call me, there's Chono's son, yeah. Isn't that incredible? It's like a, but it sounds like, you know, one of these places where you can learn so much about food and nowadays, you know, a lot of chefs would love to kind of soak in, soak up the knowledge. Um, did, what did you learn from cooking, living with your relatives there over these summers about food? You know, I wasn't, I didn't like the food there too much. Uh, <laughs> the only thing that I was okay with was the kim, the nori. Yeah. Um, and, and that's pretty much what I ate most of the time. I was forced to eat some of the vegetables that they grew in the backyard. Um, mm -hmm. I, I did notice the rice tasted a little, the rice tasted different because it was so fresh. Um, because we had our own rice patty that the whole community mm -hmm. uh, would farm together. Um, and I forgot about it because other things were so traumatic, you know, the whole trip until I opened up Danji um, and, and, and I started to remember even the food that I remembered not, not liking. Mm -hmm. I remember how it tasted so different then and now. Um, so having sort of that experience 30 years ago from, from when I opened Danji, um, I had to really think back and, and it helped, it helped. These were memories that I, I didn't think I had. Um, and the biggest reason why I opened a Korean restaurant, having never cooked at a Korean restaurant, uh, was because I knew the, the food that I ate uh, back in Suwando. And even, you know, when, nowadays when you go to the countryside, the food tastes so different than the Korean food that you can experience here uh, in New York, Koreatown, LA, Koreatown, or even, you know, restaurants in Seoul. It, it's mm -hmm. different. It's not the Korean food that I remember. It's not the Korean food that I want to cook, you know, what we're seeing at the, 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 the restaurants now. Um, so I wanted to share with, with New Yorkers what I thought Korean food should be real Korean food that I experienced back in Korea. You write that um, when you moved to New York, when you were nine, nine years old, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you, found, um, you found the food at Koreatown to mm. be a faint, like a far cry from the food that you actually enjoyed in Korea, but it gave you a sense of, of belonging that uh, you, you couldn't find elsewhere in the mm. US. Mm. Um, how important was that, do you think, to, to your identity now and your philosophy as a chef and uh, what you hope to share with folks through this book and through your cooking and elsewhere? You know, tremendously. Um, it was, I mean, the reason why I went to Korea every summer as a kid was because my mother didn't want me to uh, uh, 
forget the culture, the language, but as, uh, also to have a sense of belonging because, you know, all the schools that I went to, um, I was a minority. My, you know, I, you know, even now where, where, where we live, I'm still a minority. Um, but when you go to Korea, I don't feel uncomfortable. Well, I don't want to say uncomfortable, but I feel like I belong. Uh, mm -hmm. That I look the part. Uh, and as a young kid, I think that was very important to not always feel like a minority, to not always be more careful because, you know, people are going to judge Asians, all of Asians, by the way I acted. And that's a lot of pressure for every child. Mm -hmm. uh, but I felt like in Korea, you don't, you don't have to worry. I could be whatever, and I'm just one of everybody else. And Koreatown was that sort of connection where there was that one block or one neighborhood where I went and I wasn't a minority. I was a majority, at least in that one block or, or in that one restaurant. And I felt more comfortable and able to be myself more mm -hmm. uh, and to let go a little bit. Um, so, you know, I may not appreciate the food as much in Koreatown, mm -hmm. but, you know, so important, so important to all of my friends, um, even, you know, my child who's 11 years old, he will one day go to Koreatown and have a sense of belonging that he cannot have anywhere else in this country. Mm. I love how um, this book, which by the way, I've had the pleasure of cooking from for the last couple of months. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> it's, I mean, the, the recipes are just outstanding. And so, so there's so many of them. I mean, there's like a lot of hits, you know, the spicy stir fried squid, the soy poached black cod with daikon. Mm. But I really love reading the stories behind um, the, the recipes that you share. And I came across one recipe that I never thought to, I, I just never have seen in too many East Asian cookbooks, a recipe for steamed rice of all things. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and it's like four cups of premium short grain or medium grain rice and four and a half cups of water. Those are the ingredients, but you share um, a, a lovely story about how rice, um, how important it is to you to make really good rice. And, and it's, uh, I, I want to hear more about that, but you, you, I just want to mention that um, you had, a, you, in this story, you talk about a dishwasher turned cook. Mm -hmm. at um, Hanjan named Armando, who, Armando, yeah. Armando who, who mastered it. Mm. And who, he, he made, you said, the rice at Hanjan was never better than when Armando made it with heart and devotion, the jung sung that is an integral part of cooking Korean food. Mm. Tell us, Chef, a little bit about why rice is so important and what is the jung sung that is so integral to cooking Korean food? Um, so jung sung basically goes back to what uh, I talked about in Korean food, where it was the mother cooking for the family. Um, you know, I would define it as heart and devotion, but also just really caring enough uh, and understanding what all of these ingredients mean and how they interact so that when something is off, you just know within how to fix it. And I think that's what's so important in making rice. Because that recipe of four cups of rice and four and a half cups of water, it's correct 20% of the time. It really depends on the rice. It really depends on how old the rice is. It all depends on how good the rice is. It depends on how when the bag of rice was open, because when it dries out, you're gonna need more water. When it's a new crop, you're gonna need less water. Um, like if it's on so on dough, it's very fresh. And yes, so yes, uh, it'll be four cups and four cups. Um, and I've had old rice where it's four cups and five mm -hmm. cups of water. Um, but to teach this 
to sort of write this recipe out. I couldn't just write, write this recipe out because that's not how I teach my cooks. Mm. You know, I teach them the reason why we wash the rice, the reason why we rinse it and leave it so the water can slowly penetrate the, the, the rice. Uh -huh. And the amount of water that penetrates the rice is by nature perfect because the perfect amount is just the amount that covers the rice, no more, no less. And that will penetrate the rice. And so well, after you wash the rice in 20 minutes, the outside's going to be dry because all the water has penetrated the rice. And that's the perfect amount and that's nature. <laughs> and, and, and you know, to, to understand that and then to know, understand the texture of the rice and how, what it should be before you put the water in, to know how much water to put in before you start cooking it. Because with rice, you can't, you can't fix it. Mm -hmm. So when it's too dry, it's too dry. When it's too wet, it's too wet. You cannot fix it in the middle. You just have to fully commit. And to have that confidence, mm. um, it, it's one of the toughest things uh, to master, even for me. And to have Armando um, do it perfectly, day in, day out. Uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that he was in the book. And I don't know if, if he's going to buy this book because he's, he's not with me anymore, but um, I wanted to thank him through this book and to show respect. That's really wonderful. Um, I, I love that. Uh, I, I've always thought about rice. Chef, you don't mention this, I don't think, but um, it, you know, the finger technique <laughs> where you, you kind of like know this spot on your finger. Mm -hmm. But now that you mention all the very variables about the rice itself, that doesn't seem to add up then. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so our, our restaurant, whoever opens the bag of rice and does the first cooking is responsible oh, for, for writing the recipe for that bag. Yeah. That makes so much sense. You get to know and the that first bag. bag is always family meal because it gives us a chance to mess it up. Okay, you can mess it up from there. <laughs> oh my goodness. So what is the ideal rice? Because I, I know that, you know, in in um in other cultures it should be loose and not sticky at all. Mm. Um in Korean cook cuisine, maybe I didn't have the perfect rice always, but it tends to be, you know, short grain and more medium grain and then a little bit moister. Yes. Right? Is that right? Okay. Uh, uh, definitely moist and a little bit more starchy than I would mm -hmm. say Chinese or Vietnamese or, or, or Thai rice. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it's also because we use short grain, which is more starchy. Um, okay. um, but yeah, it should be not as sticky as Chinese sticky rice, but yeah. it should have that sort of starchy texture. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, too, because there's different ideals of what is the best rice. Well, you have to know what cuisine you're cooking you it for. Know, right? Different families in Korea have different preferences. Uh, my mom does not like any kind of real sort of texture in the middle. She likes it really soft. Okay. So, um, And for me, I like a little bit of a texture in the rice. Uh, so... Um, you know, every time she comes to my restaurant, she always complains. They made this right. You know, they made it wrong. So but it's a like, preference. A little bit al dente. Is that what you like? I wouldn't say al dente, okay. but it, it's 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 not as mushy. It doesn't okay. stick as much. Um, it, it's the it's the difference between four cups of rice and four. And, uh, such a small volume, <laughs> uh, um, but it does make a little bit of a difference. Um, it's, you know, when you feel like you have the exact amount of water needed, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of, couple of drops more. Um, it, it makes a difference. Um, yeah. yeah. I think for restaurants, it's easier to sort of go my way, mm -hmm. uh, where each kernel of rice has an individual sort of character, either being it mushy. But a lot of the older generation Koreans like the the the, the really sticky, soft, sticky. mushy, where you don't have to chew much. Yeah, <laughs> it's all a matter of preference then. Yeah, grandmother and then, and you've shown folks how to how to make it to their preference. Um, 
Cool. Mm. So, so one of the things I, I love about this book is that you have, um, you know, you're well known for your Michelin starred restaurant food, but you have a lot of more like kind of homey dishes. There's a whole spectrum of dishes throughout this book, basics like fermenting and broths and soups and so forth. Um, one dish I'm really enjoying right now is the steamed egg custard mm. um, that you often see in Korean barbecue restaurants. Mm. Mm. Um, and uh, this, it's called chawan mushi in uh, Japanese cuisine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but there's like a different, there's, there's different takes on it throughout. Um, so what, you know, why did you decide to include this one? And what is your sort of, um, you know, unique take on it? Because I know there's dashi in it. And then there's um, Korean anchovy sauce. So it's like super umami. Mm -hmm. um, What's the ideal texture in Korean cuisine and uh, for this dish? So, you know, this is sort of the the negative aspect of 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 restaurants because <laughs> they want to take shortcuts. Mm -hmm. And you know, a steamer in the middle of a commercial kitchen is something that gets in everybody's way. Uh, and when you when you steam something something you can't sort of open it and put another one in in the middle you just have to sort of finish one after the other and that doesn't work well when when you're running a restaurant so you know what most americans and even koreans who live in seoul who go to these barbecue restaurants they'll see the 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 steamed egg as not really steamed egg but just a, a egg and water in a bowl put on a burner till right. it fluffs up and right. it, just, it looks great and tastes great for about three minutes and then it starts to collapse. Overcooking. And it okay. becomes dense and it, uh, it's not custardy. Uh, mm -hmm. So I wanted to show people that's not real Korean food. That's Korean shortcut restaurant food, uh, which is fine. Uh, but that's not what you would get if you go to a friend's house and their mom is cooking you this dish. Right. Um, it is very similar to a chawamushi, where chawamushi is actually more of a personal thing, where in Japanese cuisine, yeah. you get one, you get a little thing on your Rice own. Bowl, yeah, yeah. Friends, we share. Um, so the technique that is a little bit different because it's in a larger bowl, but it's, you know, very similar, um, but it is also Korean. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's... It, so the, uh, most of the recipes in this book I do serve it at my restaurant, uh -huh. but it is also most of the recipes and the dishes you will find when you visit people's houses in Korea. It's what mothers will cook for you, um, you know, your their 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 children's friends uh, or their husband and his guests. Um, it's food that you find at home, um, which is the, the real Korean food that I you know I feel. That's thank you so much for clarifying that because I thought it was maybe a homey dish, but I've seen it elevated in fancy ways and I've seen it in the Korean. So thank you for clarifying that. And man, I mean, there's so but many it, dishes it's here. It's really easy to just make one, you know? Right, right. But to right. make it over and over and over again when the chef is yelling at you, I need it in two minutes, but then the first one's not done. <laughs> um, you know, and that's why most restaurants do it the way they do it now. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that's not that's not how it's supposed to be done well that's the beauty of writing a cookbook i yeah. love it yeah. um actually so speaking of which i think we're gonna turn it over to the audience questions maybe you guys have read this book maybe you have a burning question about a favorite recipe um or maybe you just have questions for for chef Huni. and uh, i think sari's gonna kind of moderate or choose I thank you everyone for chiming in already. Everyone seems ready and eager to to go ahead and so uh, Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, let's let's we can we're open up for uh Q and A now. Some of you have started writing your questions, which is great. Um thank you, Chef Huni. This was such a beautiful conversation. Such an honor to be with you both tonight. So let's get going. Yes. Thank you for showing us that. Actually, Chef, um, I have a quick question for you. Uh, for someone who's getting the book and does not have a lot of experience cooking Korean food, do you have a suggestion of, of which recipe to start with in the book? Um, I would say banchan. 
uh, the whole banchan chapter, it's food that you, most of it's very simple. You could cook um, within an hour, but it's also stuff that you can uh, make, put in the fridge and keep for a week. So a lot of Koreans, you know, banchan is not something that you make every day to eat every day. It's, you make it once and you eat it for the week. So it's, it's great to have like three or four banchan in the fridge because, you know, you come home from work uh, and you're tired, you don't want to cook. All you need is some hot rice uh, and take three or four banchans out of the fridge and there's your healthy, delicious Korean meal right there. Perfect, thank you. Okay, uh, Russ asks, what are the essential culinary experiences for someone visiting Seoul? Uh, many, many restaurants. Um, and make a friend so that they can take you to their mom's house. Um, or their wife's, uh, you know, their house, so their wife can cook for them. Uh, I, and, and I don't need me, me to be sexist, but still in Korea, uh, it's usually the woman cooking, and, and, and they're the better cooks. Um, so, you know, I will take a mom cooking for me any day rather than a, a famous Korean chef, including me. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you're interested, you can sort of contact me via uh, Instagram or, or Facebook. And I have a list of the restaurants that I go to that I recommend to all of my friends. And it's, it's a list of about 20, 25 restaurants that um, specifically it's, it's restaurants that I would go uh, or recommend. So just uh, contact me. And I'll, Very generous of you. <laughs> I've sent this email out to many, many people, including... Well, if you want to email it to me, I can share it in our yeah, follow-up sure, email sure. tomorrow. I'll send it to you today. Okay, for, you know, the future when we're able to travel again, that is definitely yeah. something to look forward to. All right, uh, next question from Lisa. Did you grow up cooking with your mom at all? No, my mom was the worst cook. Uh, and, and I don't eat, ever remember her really cooking much from scratch. Um, you know, her definition of cooking was bringing home uh, leftover banchan from when we ate at a restaurant and sort of mixing it with rice and gochujang and calling it a bibimbap. Um, but, she, you know, one of the reasons why I became a cook or a chef was because she was so horrible. Uh, and I started eating out at restaurants starting uh, high school. Uh, most, you know, my mom was very busy uh, running her company. So most of the meals that I had starting high school was out uh, at restaurants. And I loved, my first fine dining experience was Ario, uh, Upper East Side. I was a junior in high school. And that's where, you know, you had to take all your private school girl dates to, <laughs> because, you know, uh, in Manhattan, people love, you know, even high school kids start going to fine dining restaurants. And I fell in love with it. You know, the, it was so theatrical. Uh, it was just so interesting. Uh, and, you know, having a meal for two, over two hours and not being bored, it was just fascinating. Um, so thanks to my mom, I, I ended up loving restaurants and became a chef. <laughs> That's a wonderful answer. <laughs> okay, uh, Quina asks, um, th their Korean mother used to bury kimchi in the backyard to mm. ferment. Uh, they live in an apartment and don't have the backyard, but her mother says that this step is a must and therefore tells her not to make kimchi because it won't turn out correctly. Can you confirm? No, no, that's <laughs> right specifically about kimchi refrigerators. They are expensive. The cheapest one is like $3,000. But the kimchi refrigerator is so important that every single family has one in Korea. And when you get married, uh, one of the traditional presents is you get a bed and you get a kimchi refrigerator. You know, you, every family, a new family starts, starts out with those two uh, uh, furniture uh, or appliance. Because the kimchi refrigerator has several doors and compartments. So when you open the door, there are more, there is a drawer. And then you take out the drawer, there's another compartment. Basically means that there are many, many different compartments that unless you need to open that specific compartment, the temperature, the humidity, uh, and the pressure is going to be constant the whole time. And that's the key to fermenting, uh, to have no light, no oxygen, and a constant temperature, even a 30 second, fluctuation, like every time you open the refrigerator, that will sort of, I wouldn't say kill the refrigeration, uh, the fermentation, but 
um, not maximize the fermentation. So that's why your mom, what your mom says is true, underground is the most, you know, it's the perfect environment. But if you don't live in an apartment, the kimchi refrigerator is a very close second. Yeah. All right, well, hopefully this evening was life-changing then for Quina. <laughs> um, okay, what is your favorite cuisine outside of Korean food and why? Uh, it would be sushi and steak. Um, I've always been about, about the ingredients. Um, and, you know, when you're making sushi or when you're making or cooking steak, you can't, it's, you can't start with bad fish or less than stellar fish to make good sushi. And you can't, you can't use less than stellar uh, beef to make a good steak. Um, and I really enjoy the flavor, the natural flavor of these ingredients. Uh, and that's what excites me the most. Um, and I think those two cuisines, I wouldn't say cuisines, but those two uh, foods uh, is, those are the restaurants that I go out to most uh, before this pandemic. Uh, it's probably the, the food that I cook. Steak is what I cook the most at home. And um, sushi is what I get delivered or pick up the most. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I tried to make sushi. I worked at Masa, so I know how to make it. But when I'm making it, it's just not fun eating it. And that's, <laughs> and that's you know, that's when I'm cooking, I, I, I just don't enjoy it as much as having it made for me. Um, so, yeah. Where do you like to go food. eat it? Yeah. Where? Yeah. Wow. I, ha I have a lot of friends who are, who are uh, you know, sushi chefs. We won't tell any of them. <laughs> no, uh, I, I will say I live in Long Island City. And last year, uh, two years ago, this place, Daizen, opened. Um, and it's the one real, you know, omakase, uh, traditional Edo style, uh, you know, restaurants uh, in all of Queens. There aren't that many. Uh, and it's two blocks away from home. And the omakase is $75 for 10 pieces, uh, a roll, soup. So that's where I go the most. Uh, to splurge, I think Noda is very special, N-O-D-A. Um, Nas is special. And both of those chefs, I think, came from Saito. They were sous chefs at Sushi Saito in Japan. I go to Japan about five times a year. So um, I, I eat a lot of sushi in Japan. And if you go to Tokyo, there's this one restaurant called, uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, oh, I'll get back to it. Uh, but there's this one place where they give you 35 pieces, no, no less. Uh, and you're pressured to finish because if you tell the chef, oh, I'm, I'm full, everybody, everybody around you will say, no, there's only two more. There's only three more, but they're lying. There's 35. <laughs> um, yeah. That sounds very doable to me. <laughs> I, I go to Japan a lot, so um, yeah. I just want to mention there's a Korean style sashimi recipe here that looks amazing. <laughs> and... Uh... It has a lot, it's called hui, which means mm -hmm. live fish, right? Mm. Yeah. And the difference between Japanese style sashimi and Korean hui is because Koreans uh, love sort of a fish that's just been killed with rigor mortis that has a lot of texture. It's chewy because fish that's just been killed with rigor mortis, the more you chew, the more flavor comes out. Mm. And, and that's completely different than the fish, the sashimi that we know of that melts in your mouth because it's been a couple of days where the muscles have relaxed um, and it's aged. So Japanese, they never, fresh doesn't mean it's killed that day. Fresh means it was killed two, three days ago um, because the muscles need to relax because the Japanese style sashimi, it's not about chewing, chewing, chewing. It's about, you know, it, velvety smoothness that sort of melts uh, in your mouth and sort of goes away after about five, six chews. For Korean raw fish, it's about 20, 20, 25 times where you have to chew and every bite, the juices come out. Uh, and it's that same uh, philosophy applies to beef as well, where Wagyu 
is melt in your mouth. You know, it's not very chewy. It's very texturally, very, very soft and velvety. Where Korean hanubi, it's chewy as hell, but it's, it's, there's just more flavor. And that is, is a big difference. Not, you know, one's not better than the other, but um, it's different and equally good, but definitely different. Um, so obviously a lot of restaurants have pivoted like yours to take out delivery meal kits. Um, this question is, do you think these changes in new formats will continue once restaurants return, you know, to normal, whatever that looks like? Um, or maybe speak for yourself. What are you thinking about in terms of your own restaurants? You know, just to be completely honest, my food is not as delicious when you warm it up at home. It's mm -hmm. just, it just isn't. Uh, it tastes a lot better fresh coming out from my kitchen to the dining room table. Um, but, you know, we're doing what we're doing because that's what our customers want. Uh, that's what they need. That's what, you know, we as a business need to survive. That's what I need to do so my, my staff have, you know, they have a job, you know, that they can put food on their family's table. Um, do I enjoy personally delivering? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's very new to me. Um, I've never been, I've never delivered. I've cooked, I've served, I've done, but I've never delivered food and, and I'm doing it now. Um, it's humbling. Uh, it's great in that I feel like I have another degree of connection with my customers. I know where they live now. So they can't really complain about my food. Um, but also, you know, a lot of the apartments, um, I can't enter through the, the main entrance. I have to use the service entrance. Uh, and, and that's, it's humbling. It's sort of, uh, this is a new experience for me. Do customers uh, realize you're the chef when you, when you appear? Uh, initially, no. Um, they don't think that I actually do the delivering. But uh, they figure it out sooner or later. Um, I've had some not so polite encounters with the, the doorman. Um, but then suddenly the next week, they're very friendly. <laughs> um, Are you like, do you know who I am? No, no, no. no. <laughs> you know, I'm just very thankful that they, they are keeping my restaurants open. All, you know, all the people who are ordering. Um, but... Yeah, it's a humbling, it's a new experience. Um, but, you know, you just do what we need to do to survive. Yeah. Mm. Will I, to be, and to answer that question, do I want to keep doing this? No, I don't. I want people to come to my restaurant and to really eat the food that I imagine, not food that I cook, I cool down, deliver, and I do give very detailed instructions, but Still, I want to be in control of when I think that food is, you know, has reached maximum potential and serve it. Um, and that's why I became a chef. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, one more question. Uh, just to your point about the sashimi, why do you think Koreans favor chewiness as a texture so much from Eric? I don't know if that's a why question. It's, it's just, it is. Um, Koreans prefer chewing, uh, not just, and it's not just fish, steak, it's a lot of things. Koreans like chewy things, um, you know, and, and I've heard that one of the ways you can tell the difference between Korean facial features and, and Japanese facial features is, is our mandibles. Koreans chew a lot. So our mandibles, our sort of lower cheek tend to be a little bit more um, uh, built <laughs> than the Japanese. Um, it's just, nobody asks why. That's just our preference. It's our difference. It's sort of like, you know, Koreans like spicier food than the Japanese. Japanese prefers a, a sweeter food than the Koreans. It's just, you know, we're uh, only an hour apart, but that's, that's the difference, yeah. Eric says, we also talk a lot. He's Korean. <laughs> oh, okay. And, and, you know, I'm so thankful that there is such a huge difference because you get to enjoy two very different cultures uh, 
with a short one hour, you know, plane ride, um, the language, the, the, the people, the, the movies, the food, everything is so different. And, you know, anybody who goes to Asia um, really need to do the Taiwan, China, uh, Korea, and Japan, at least those four. And then you could go a little bit further and do, you know, a whole slew of more countries. But those four are just so close and so cheap to get around. Those four countries, I think you, you should do in one trip. All right, thank you. Well, hopefully one day we can all do that. <laughs> <laughs> We can all go anywhere at some point in the future. I'm actually going in two weeks to Korea. Oh, wow. And, okay. Uh, well, be careful. Thank you. I have a TV show that I need to film there. Um, and it's because, it's also because that I'm not making a living now. Uh, I'm not getting a paycheck. So, um, thankfully, a chef, we can do other things. We can write books. We can appear on TV. Uh, it's just survival mode for us right now. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, you are certainly wonderful to listen to. So I hope to find out more about your TV show because this has just been, yeah. yeah, this has been so wonderful, Chef. Thank you so much. And Kathy, this was fantastic. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. You know, like I said at the beginning, it's so special to be able to connect with people from all over. And even though it's obviously not ideal, just as, you know, Chef says, it's, we're all, doing what we can to, to keep going. Um, it really just means so much to us to, to gather even over, you know, through a computer screen, especially in these really difficult times. So I thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you'll come back for our gastro uh, MOFAD program next Sunday night, same time. We're going to be with Phil Rosenthal, who's the host of Somebody Feed Phil, and he's going to be talking about Jewish deli culture. So a little bit different, but it should be really fun. Um, so I hope to see you then. And I'll follow up with everyone tomorrow with an email. And yeah, go, go buy My Korea. Start cooking at home. Thank you all so much. Good night. Take good care. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha.